My name is Sharon Poli, and I am the executive director of the Fine Arts Work Center. And it is such a thrill to look around this room and welcome our in-person and our virtual audience this evening. Um, special thanks to some of our trustees and others in attendance, including Bert Yarborough from our Visual Arts Committee is here tonight. So we're here, we're open to the public. We are gathered in the beautiful, newly renovated Stanley Kunitz Common Room, named in memory of our founder, a poet twice named Poet Laureate of the United States. Stanley and the founders of the Fine Arts Work Center envisioned a creative home in Provincetown where emerging artists and writers could gather together in community and focus on the creation of new work. The Fine Arts Work Center has dedicated ourselves to this mission for more than 50 years. Our signature program is our renowned seven-month fellowship where 10 extraordinary artists and 10 extraordinary writers come together and live in Provincetown for seven months to build community together. Tonight we are of course joined by many of our fellows in attendance. It's great to see everyone. So tonight I hope you have the chance to take a look in the Hudson D. Walker Gallery at the exhibition by our visual arts fellow, Nick Fagan. Everybody give Nick a big round of applause for an awesome opening tonight. It's beautiful work, please stop by. In addition to our signature fellowship, the Fine Arts Work Center is committed to amplifying the creative vitality of Provincetown, the nation's most enduring artist community. Each year, we bring nationally recognized artists and writers to Provincetown for events like this evening's event, all free and open to the public. We are so honored tonight to welcome Michelle Seagray, and we look forward to learning more about Michelle's practice. Tomorrow night, we will host writer and past fellow Chris Stuck. Hi, Chris. Welcome. And we hope you'll come back tomorrow at 7 p.m. So, of course, we couldn't do this without the support of many, many people. And we are grateful to everyone who supports the Fine Arts Work Center and helps us create this community that truly shapes contemporary culture. Special thanks to our partners at the institutional level, the National Endowment for the Arts, the Massachusetts Cultural Council, the Arts Foundation of Cape Cod, the Fund for the Visual Arts on Cape Cod of the Cape Cod Foundation, the Homestead Foundation, and the Provincetown Tourism Fund. I also want to lift up our partner, East End Books, a lo beloved local independent bookseller who manages our bookstore here at the Fine Arts Work Center, so please do support them. Um, and a little bit of housekeeping. Our restrooms are located down the hall. Now, it's my extreme pleasure to introduce Visual Arts Fellow Elizabeth Flood, who's going to welcome and introduce tonight's guest. Liz. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Good evening. Uh, my name is Liz Flood. I am a current Visual Arts Fellow here at the Work Center. And it is my absolute pleasure tonight to introduce Michelle Segray. Um, I first met Michelle in the summer of 2019 at the Skowhegan School of Painting and Sculpture. Michelle was living and making work there while her partner Steve DiMenedeno was on the faculty. Um, I was so excited to hear when you were coming to give a lecture and do studio visits, so it's, thank you for coming. I first encountered Michelle's sculptures in her studio there one night and was overwhelmed with a web-like structure which seemed to envelop the room. Wire, string, organic matter, paint, plaster, and stone find their way into her sculptures which seem to have a life of their own. They're both cellular and galactic in their scale, folding inwards and expanding outwards. Michelle was born in Tel Aviv, Israel, and currently lives in New York. She received her BFA at the Cooper Union and studied at the Tyler School of Art in Rome. She is the recipient of numerous prestigious awards, including the John Simon Guggenheim Foundation Fellowship, the Civitella Ranieri Foundation Fellowship, and a NIFA Fellowship in Sculpture. Michelle is represented by Derek Eller Gallery in New York. She has had numerous solo and two-person exhibitions, most recently at Derek Eller, 56 Henry in New York, Ray's Projects in Detroit, and at the University of the Arts in Philadelphia. She has exhibited her sculptures in many group exhibitions across the globe, including recent shows at Nancy Margolis Gallery in New York and Jeffrey Deitch in LA. Her work has been acquired by several collections, including the Museum of Modern Art, the New Museum in New York, and the Colorado University of Art Museum in Boulder. She currently teaches at the Cooper Union and LaGuardia Community College. 
Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Michelle. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, so nice to see you all in person. Um, thank you, Liz, for that introduction. Um, I'm going to show you work starting from the very beginning. <laughs> um, this is uh, going back to 1995. Um, uh, this so the work that I'm maybe not so known for is um, my first pieces of sculpture, which were um, mostly made out of beeswax. So I had experimented with a lot of different materials, um, organic materials like, um, like uh, soil and mold and... Um, and I finally settled on beeswax um, and paper mache. So I was I had certain parameters of working that I set, which I wanted um, I wanted the materials to be um, very hands-on, very to um, uh, not toxic, and um, and and I wanted to be able to do direct hands-on sculpting without any kind of fabrication or, um, or, or uh, mold making. Um, so I started making these objects that were um, based on things in the real world, blown up in scale, monumentalized. And they were mostly um, pieces of detritus and garbage um, that I would um, blow up about 17 and a half times life size. So this was from a series of um, slices of bread that filled a room. They were about five feet or so tall. Um, the details were super magnified. Um, and I was kind of interested in this idea of like um, making, uh, giving you the feeling that you're looking at the world through a distortion lens of some kind um, where you're, perception would be heightened in some way and the details on the work would kind of suck you into a, a micro um, universe um, so they were so the holes the pores and the bread were like openings into another um, space and a lot of things were going on in my head like just in, an interest in decay and um, uh, and with decay, an interest in regeneration and rebirth. Um, I was um, making forms that were kind of absurd and grotesque as well, um, and that kind of mined the subconscious mind. Um, there were a lot of references to the body and to nature, um, and the forms themselves were kind of almost like anthropomorphized. Um, and it was also around this time, so this is now 2006, um, the work started to become more and more abstract and more loosely based on things from the real world. So cactuses would then become more like, you know, like, like abstract forms rather than uh, actual b based on real cactus. Um, it was also around this time that I started to um, think about this idea of like when you look at a work of art, it it feels like it looks back at you. And so there's this kind of exchange that happens between the viewer and 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 the work. Um, and it's an exchange of, of energy or information. It's like the piece kind of sends out a coded message to the viewer and the viewer in, in a sense responds back. And so I started to think about this idea of, um, of the sculptures being like having this kind of force and presence that created um, a space between 
a relationship between the viewer and the work. And it was the meaning and power of the work would, was rooted in that kind of exchange. Um, so this is actually one of the last beeswax pieces. Um, it was a very labor-intensive process. Um, I would build a form out of metal and paper mache, and then I would paint it with the beeswax. I would have to melt the wax in a double boiler, and um, this took would take like hours to just get the, the wax to melt. And then I, I developed this technique of working with the hot wax on top of the armature um, so that it's both painted onto the paper mache and then also like sculpted by hand. So all the details were like um, wax that I would that I would roll in my hands and while it was still warm, I would attach it to the form. So it's very slow, um, very slow and labor intensive and it was a very kind of A plus B equals C type of process. And I started to feel um, kind of oppressed by by the the whole um, uh, you know like the, the material started to have this kind of tyranny over my life <laughs> where I couldn't make a form without using the beeswax and ideas were coming faster than I could execute them so it became a problem and I knew that I had to um, to kind of find a way of breaking to break away from this dependency on this material. Um, so I started to ex experiment with just working with um, the materials that were underneath the beeswax and, and, and trying to train myself to just leave them without applying any wax, you know? And it was really hard to like to accept the work as finished. It took a long time until finally one day I had made this form and it had been sitting around in my studio for several weeks, maybe even months, I think, until I finally one day came in and, and, um, and felt like I, it was done. Like I could finally recognize and accept it as a finished piece. And it was kind of a, um, a eureka moment to realize like, wow, that's actually, that's, that's a, a, a complete sculptor, <laughs> sculpture. So it opened up um, the doors and, and the floodgates rather of like what materials were possible in the sculpture and what, um, what exactly would constitute and be acceptable as a work of art. Um, and I began to use all kinds of materials like test pieces, like the, the piece in the middle there that has these three things that were just like little um, test pieces that I'd had in the studio for years. Um, and I felt like I was developing a new language that was um, very open, like, like it was no longer the A plus B equals C, but it, it in like a new way of working was introduced where anything was possible, the equation could have infinite possibilities. Um, and and I could work very improvisationally in this in this way and not know when a piece was was go what the, what the piece would look like when it was done and not necessarily ever really know when it was done you know um, so I <coughs> I've thought of these works oops I thought of these works as um, kind of like almost like diagrams, models of, of um, galaxies, univ um, solar systems, but then also I saw them as like going back inside themselves into like micro worlds, like they could be, it could be like a molecule or, or an atom. Um, so, so I liked the way that they could express both big space and little space. Um, and I felt like that was actually a way to create a kind of movement through time with, with these pieces. So this one has a lot of different oddball materials, like there's cat litter in there that um, <laughs> was mixed with, with um, soil, and there's um, modeling clay, and 
latex gloves. I should, I would use the pointer, but it fell off the table and all the batteries came out. <laughs> um, so I can just describe to you. <laughs> um, so I would, I would start with, oh, thank you. Um, I would start with a piece of metal and I would bend it into a shape and then um, tie, tie wire around it and then start patching it up with paper mache and it was really fun to do and, and felt much more kind of like playing, like playful, you know, like, like oh, thank you. <laughs> like, like making art was more, of became this more kind of unpredictable, exciting, um, this uh, exciting endeavor. Um, and also, I, f I, I liked um, to play with, gra with gravity, like just getting these things to stand was kind of exciting, like, you know, like how precarious can I make the form before it was, it's just gonna topple over. Um, so I, so I, I felt like this, like that kind of, created a tension in the work, like, like it, 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 it gave the piece this feeling like um, it was on the verge of collapse. Um, so it was, it was, it was like, you know, like how, like, like it was pushing the boundaries of, of, of acceptability in a sense, like, like not like off balance rather than balance, like embracing that kind of, um, uh, boundary between the the collapse and the non-collapse. <laughs> um, so this is now, this is an image from 2012 of a show that I titled Lost Songs of the Filament. Um, and I was also recycling a lot of the older pieces, the ones that were kind of you know, more based on actual objects. So this piece in the middle here, um, which is called Transmissions of the Threadbare, is um, the chicken bone that's standing up there is from 1997. And um, so I could found like a new, like a way to like give a new life to all this old work that I had made that had so much time and energy invested in it. They could now like be um, revived in, in a new um, context. Um, and also at this time I was, I was playing music. I had started collaborating with uh, an artist friend of mine named Jennifer Syrie, who's a sculptor. Um, and we started making, writing songs um, and there was like, so it was a lot of like musical kind of improvisational music going on in my life at this time and songwriting, playing with words, wordplay, and all of that infiltrated into this work. Um, and I started m coming up with titles for the work and the titles also would then circle back and influence how I made the work. Um, so I thought that was kind of an interesting, like back and forth process. Um, this one is called Let Me Love Your Brain, which also was the title of a song that I wrote, so it was, I would sometimes use the song names. Um, and this also has the recycled bone, uh, chicken bone made out of plaster and beeswax. This one is called Cloud Minder. And a lot of um, visits to um, see live jazz, improvisational jazz. Um, I think that was actually a big deal too in the way I was starting to th think of my work. Um, I, I got um, very um, sucked into certain linear materials like wire and thread and yarn um, and I started to see the power of the line and how, um, how something so, so skinny and delicate could also emanate a kind of electrical energy. Um, 
and that interested me, like how line can activate space, you know, so negative space around a line becomes um, just as important as um, as the positive spaces in the sculpture, right? So, but with a line, you can you can kind of encompass more of that negative space. Um, so it was interesting to me how like the line also would set up relationships between um, objects. You know, like if you put a line, if you put a, a piece of string from the ceiling to the floor, right? Then it becomes a way of like connecting two entities together and then all of that space um, becomes activated around the the yarn and then the and then the line just as a like as a piece of of uh, it's a segment right so it's so just geometrically it's it has this um, ability to suggest um, movement into a c continuous movement into infinity into infinite space um, so i started to play with that more and more you know and to see this kind of um uh way you know just to, to play with this ability of of the skinny materials like wire and yarn to um kind of transport through space um also there's a lot of like organic materials that I end up sticking in this in the works like um, off sometimes there are things that have been in my studio for <laughs> for years um, they end up in the work um, this piece is called God's eye uh, with spelled with a Z like Godzilla um, and it was a, f a pretty improvisationally um, formed sculpture in the sense that I started to uh, tie the plastic lace around a, an armature form and as I was making it I realized I was making a god's eye <laughs> so I kind of went with it and continued the piece to, to you know have this like giant um, god's eye form um, and I the you know, the thing I was talking about before about this um, exchange that the viewer has with the work and this kind of um, back and forth of information um, became more amplified in this work. Like I s started to more actively push this idea of, of the work as a kind of transmitter um, and the viewer as a kind of receiver and then the relationship also would be re in reverse to that. The viewer could be the transmitter and the piece the receiver. Um, and so in fact they do kind of resemble, like this one looks kind of like a giant microphone also. <laughs> um, this one is called Once Upon a Time, The End. Um, and I was very inspired by my kids art i mean i know it's kind of corny to say but like who doesn't like kid art right it's so good <laughs> um and so i i guess this is now 2012 yeah so my 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 kid was ma would come to my studio um sometimes when he was little and i would be like sitting in a chair staring for hours at something some form that I began not knowing what to do, you know, just like staring, staring, staring. And meanwhile, my kid would be on the floor just grabbing all kinds of materials and, and making stuff, you know, and, and I, was so, I was so blown away by, by observing that and, um, and I, I tried to kind of like um, capture that way of working, you know, like I, like with this piece, it wouldn't stand up, the piece of metal wouldn't sit stand up, it kept falling over, so I happened to have this large rock in my space, and I just placed the rock there, thinking it would just be tempor temporary, just to see how much weight I needed, and then I end up, ended up just gluing it on there with the paper mache, so it became part of the form. So things like that would happen a lot, like a kind of like rigging, you know, like a, like like the form in the center here. 
I can use this fancy thing now. The, this <laughs> string thing here um, was falling over incessantly, and so I had to weigh it down with something, and um, it was originally going to just be temporary just to get it to stabilize. I hung these screws with tape and, and thread, and then I was like, wow, that's kind of cool. So it get became part of the piece. So that one is called um, Oracle in Reverse. And this one is called The Collector. I was kind of envisioning this entity that um, was a kind of warrior aggressor with the um, pitchfork and um, kind of collecting and absorbing everything in its path. Um, the pieces started to become more and more complex in their construction and I had to figure out ways for them to come apart, you know, so this actually comes apart into several pieces um, so that I could get it in and out of my <laughs> studio. Um, and, and that became part of like the whole engineering, you know, like how to get something to stand and then how to get, how to m construct it so it would come apart. Um, this is a very tall piece that's very much like a, like a giant transmitter, right? <laughs> um, it's called Cryptanalysis of the Enigma. So this is now 2013. And I made this piece also, 2013. Um, this, is, this is a kind of a complicated assortment of forms. Um, the, the shape over here is a recycled work from 2002, which is a giant mushroom made out of beeswax. And then this um, was a kind this amoeba form um, I was working on as a separate piece, and then I got it into my head to attach the two forms together with um, yarn and string. Um, so it's called self-reflexive narcissistic supernova. <laughs> um, and it has like, so the back of the mushroom has a point um, right there somewhere where all these pieces of yarn emanate out um, from the center point. And, and dried mushrooms are hung, or rather mushrooms were hung on, on the yarns. They were hung fresh and then they dried out while they were on the yarn. And so it's almost like the um, mushroom is projecting an image of itself into space, so, uh, so to say, so to speak, whatever. Um, so this mushroom originally was a nine foot tall mushroom with a stem. And so I removed the stem and then turned it on its side. And so all this stuff here is, bees, is beeswax. And at the, t at the time that I was making this work, I, was, um, I happened to be watching all of the original Star Trek episodes from the 60s. Um, and I came across this one episode called The Immunity Syndrome, which was about a giant um, single cell organism in space, uh, an amoeba that's 11 miles in diameter, and the amoeba eats everything that comes in, in its path. And the absurdity of that was something that I just loved, you know, like how, well, I mean, Star Trek is so, can be so crazy and absurd. Um, and so I was kind of uh, partially inspired by that um, episode. And this is your, this is the side view, so you can see how all those mushrooms are kind of flying, flying in space to meet their doom in the amoeba. <laughs> um, this is a piece called Powers of Tenuous, which is based on, uh, th the title comes from Powers of Ten by Ray and Charles Eames. So this cube is 10 by 10 by 10. Um, squares. 
And this piece, Porous Porous, is the first piece that I incorporated um, dry bread in, um, which was kind of happen happened kind of by accident because I uh, was getting upset about all the bread that was being wasted in my household. <laughs> I would buy a loaf of bread and then within a day it was stale, you know, and con we were constantly arguing about it at home. Anyway, so I started to take all the dry bread to my studio thinking, well, maybe, just maybe, <laughs> I can do something with this. And so I, I experimented for a while with it, and I've, I realized that when I painted um, the bread with um, this vinyl paint, this flash stuff, that it seemed to kind of seal it, and it became quite strong. Like, it was already very, very strong um, uh, when it was dry, but the, the paint made it feel like m much more kind of um, uh, uh, strong. And and so I started to use it as a material, and it was also like referencing going back to the original bread pieces that I made. Um, and the h my interest in bread is, you know, I, I, I'm interested in the fact that bread is made with yeast, and yeast is a fungus. And so I have played with fungus, you know, with in other ways. Um, and, and it's almost like this, um, it's like an object that tells the history of our culture, you know, like, like bread has been around um, since hunter, since we were hunter gathering nomads. Um, they've now found breadcrumbs in Jordan that are uh, 14,000 years old or something. So, we, so they know that um, people were actually making bread um, before agricultural communities were, were, um, were started. So w they were already you know, making bread as, n as nomads. Um, so I, so I, liked, I loved the like, kind of connection of this this thing to, you know, like you go back 14,000 years and there's this yeast with a DNA and, and all that. And then you can fast forward to now, you know, the bread in the supermarket. So it was like this like weird connector a history his of, of his an into ancient history. Um, and so the title of the work, Porous Porous, is kind of a play on um, all the different forms of porousness that exist here, like the, the sort of amoeba shape with the, with the um, holes th in the section, and then the pores of the bread, and then the um, foam-like polyurethane fo foam, which has pores in it as well. You know, so it was like porous, porous, porous. Um, I just like the word, too. <laughs> That's a close-up. And... Um, Incredibly, like, this piece has held up really well. Um, when Derek, the guy that I show with, was asking me, like, Michelle, is this piece going to be okay? Is it going to last? Um, I was like, oh, yes. I researched and found um, the, you know, museum has 3,000-year-old bread from Egypt. <laughs> so, yeah, it's going to last. <laughs> um, so I've I've since made um, these smaller bread pieces, which I call drift loaf, and they're you know like if you can imagine the big works are are like the transmitters. These are like the r transistor radios in a sense because they're all tabletop sized works that kind of have um, uh, a feeling that they're transmitting. And these are the drift loaf totems, which are um, loaves of bread that have been dried out and stacked on top of each other. Um, this is a work called Foot of a Grimy, which was very improvisationally designed grabbing of sticks and yarn <laughs> and getting it to stand. Um, 
So I'll show you a few from this time period is now 2017, 18. Um, this is colony collapse. And now I'm coming to a show that um, was from 2017, 18. It was kind of like a crossover November to January or something. Um, and the the time frame when I was making these works was was 2016, 17, and it was you know like through the whole like election thing and everything, and um, and I was like feeling like you know I always feel like I'm a kind of filter, like uh, I'm the k filtering the n the news and and um, and information and events and like misinterpret misinterpretations of science and whatever you know like just like filtering all this stuff and then somehow it comes out the other end as you know as 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 sculpture um and so it's like like i i use i feel like i use sculpture to kind of process the the reality and to deal with <laughs> my emotions sometimes you know like i process and and the thing that comes out is is um, can might not really reflect all the kind of turmoil that went in. Um, so I I was tapping into a kind of unhinged energy, like listening to the news. Um, and I called, I named the show for the piece on the right. The orange one is called Dawn of the Lo Dawn of the Looney Tune. So the whole, sh the show was called Dawn of the Looney Tune. Um, this one features a hubcap in the middle um, that looks at itself in the mylar mirror. Um, and it's called That's All Folks. It's kind of from the uh, Looney Tune, the end of the Looney Tune um, bubble. And that's my view. So I was really having a great time kind of um, working with the yarn in this like totally free form way, like making a form and then s stretching the yarn back and forth in this kind of improvisational um, zigzagging. Um, and it's not, it's, I call it fake weaving because I, you know, I'm not doing any kind of traditional weaving with it, but um, it's, it's uh, it. What ends up happening is that the form gains strength and becomes more set as a form the more the yarn loops through the armature. Um, so it was so. One of the things that's in about interest nice about that method is that it's like tiny, fragile parts, you know, the, s the soft yarn that has no structure or whatever, um, the more that you use it crisscrossing on itself, it becomes stable and more and takes on a form. Um, so that was kind of like a new discovery, like to work with this soft material um, instead of like rigid bulbous forms, right? So became more and more interested in the soft part uh, aspect of that because I could see that then it opened up the possibilities of making the work more collapsible. Um, and so this one is called um, Dawn of the Looney Tune and it features, I don't know if you can, how well you can see them, but they're um, dozens of carrots that are hanging here. Um, so the carrots would be hung um, fresh from the supermarket <laughs> and then I would leave them on the form and they would dry out and they would um, become smaller and smaller and smaller into these tiny little, you know, dried up um, fossils kind of, you know. And, and the piece um, could be revived by introducing fresh carrots. So so during the course of the show, I had um, once a week, I would have the feeding of the carrots <laughs> and I would come with fresh carrots and I would leave the dried ones there, but 
introduced the new ones, and so it would they would all you know the brightness of the orange would kind of revive and reactivate the piece. Um, this one is called Clown Clutter, and it has some dancing <laughs> house sponges, kitchen sponges. Um, also exhibiting with those other works were these more kind of experimental pieces that I call the pets. Um, and they were loaves of bread that I decided not to dry out and instead I put them into fish tanks and let mold grow in the, on them um, with some other little things like moss and uh, rocks and stuff. And I had some really strange um, works um, come out of this. Unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately, um, despite my attempts to seal the tanks really carefully and well, you know, with glass on the top and silicone and everything, the mold would find a way to make its way out and then you could smell it. And so it was really disgusting. <laughs> so I ended up, uh, I think, uh, this one is called Degenerate Pet. Um, this one is called New Pet. And they're all like different, like the, f the mold is so beautiful um, in some ways, you know, it's like a flower. Um, this one is called Pet of a New Order, and this is the only one that made it. It's the only one that didn't stink. Uh, so I, the other ones I ended up having to part with. Um, this is a piece with a featuring a dry mushroom. It's called the Bozo. And the mushrooms... Um, you know, they, they were referencing back to the the giant uh, beeswax mushrooms that I had made many of during the um, 90s and 2000s. Um, and then also, you know, the like playing into the my interest in um, fungus and decay and the mycelium. And so the mycelium, you know, being like this kind of network that exists under the ground, you don't see the mycelium, but you see the fruiting body, which is the mushroom that grows above the ground. And the mycelium is like the network that is act that we now know is a communicator, facilitator with uh, to the roots of other plants. So, so that was, I found that to be interesting how the mycelium was, you know, the is known as like the internet, <laughs> the, um, because it helps trees and other plants to communicate um, under, under the ground. Um, I know it sounds a little crazy, right? But, but I, I swear I read this. <laughs> I read this, this book um, called The Hidden Life of Trees. Did anybody ever read that? Yeah, it's such a great book. Um, and and um, oh, that wasn't expecting that piece, okay. So I'll, I'll go back to the mushrooms a little bit. But this is called Substantial Stringata. Um, and it's another one that has like a kind of weapon-like form in it. Um, and so here's the another mushroom piece. So this one is called Motherboard. Um, so the mushroom, you know, galaxy of like connect network. And this is called map of an or map of an organ donor. So more mushrooms in sp in space kind of thing. Um, this piece is from 2020, and it's called "Just Why Do You Think You're a Plant." Um, and the title comes from a Philip K. Dick story called "Piper in the Woods," where uh, this guy comes back from a, a mission on Mars uh, an, 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 at an army base that's st stationed on Mars. And he comes back and he um, 
announces to everyone that he is now a plant. And so they send him to the psychiatrist's office and he has to sit on the couch and answer the question, just why do you think you're a plant? <laughs> uh, it's a great story, anyway. Um, so I was kind of, um, I, I recycled this form here. F this, this was a giant beeswax carrot, rotting carrot that I had made in 1997. Um, it was used to be 10 feet long. It got bro it fell off of a loft and broke in half. <laughs> so I, I recycled it in this work and um, I guess one of the ideas play I'm playing around with here is just this kind of interconnected interconnectedness between living things, you know, plants and animals and how um, uh, even um, like that everything shares genetic information and, um, and that space is essentially alive, it's not empty. Um, so this piece kind of um, is a more kind of installational uh, approach but also features this, this weaving that I started in Skowhegan where I met Liz. <laughs> <laughs> I think I worked on that like all summer in, in Skowhegan. Um, and it's, uh, it's a, a, an over-under, over-under kind of weaving technique. So it's not the more improvisational um, w method. And I started to get more drawn into that way of working both in the more chaotic improvisational freeform weaving, that's the fake weaving, and then the... Um, the more kind of slower, methodical, organized, um, over and under weaving. So you can see that, what that looks like there. And that led to um, this work that came after that called Orbit of the Haggis, um, which I feel has kind of like a black hole kind of feel to it. <laughs> Um, with with m these large dried mushrooms um, that I found in a market that I didn't paint them. They actually look like that. That's um. So the, the pieces in the last few years, the last couple of years, have become much more kind of centered looking in a, sa in a sense, like um, through the, the more methodical approach to the weaving. This one is called Star Zero. And um, it's weird, like, looking at these, thinking about how I've been working with this same kind of radiating form, like, basically my whole life. I don't know exactly why, but... Um, but the pieces that I showed you, you know, from the 90s still also had these kind of like holes of like sp space emanating out outward. Um, so in, tw in 2020, um, I started making um, work outside, was well, actually in lockdown, began in lockdown and then continued um, out of the city, and I was um, much more kind of connected to the landscape there and to the night sky in particular. And the next few works that I'm going to show you, which are the last ones, um, are all inspired by some of the kind of vision, more of kind of visionary things that I was experiencing while lying on my back in a field, <laughs> looking up at the sky. Um, and, and I felt like there was, there was something there. I don't know. It was like, it was very strange um, to be in the country for that long, five months. Because I'm very much a city kid. <laughs> I grew up in, this in New York City. Um, but I always have had this connection to... Um, to nature and to being in the country, but had ne I had never spent that long in the country before, ever. So five months 
of observing the sky and the stars and the planets was just like so intense. Um, and and the fact that it happened like during the whole COVID thing made it kind of more deep for me, you know? So, um, so these are the last few works. This one is called I Talk to the Trees, which was also a song that I wrote at the time. <laughs> Um, and it's, um, it features this acrylic form in the center that radiates out. Um, so I started to work on the wall as well. Um, the patterns here of this weaving are kind of imitating the, um, wood grain that you would see on wood. And this piece is called Eight Body Problem. Oh, uh, sorry, not Eight Body Problem. <laughs> Eight Body Chorus. And the title is sort of a play on this uh, book that I had read around this time called Three Body Problem. It's a series, a science fiction series by um, Shishan Liu. Um, And just for scale, <laughs> put that photographer put himself in there. And those are those two blobs are um, beeswax blobs that are holding the piece up off the ground. So it's actually suspended off the ground. And those are dried mushrooms that form a kind of clock face on the work. Um, and that's a reishi mushroom. So this is out in Portland, Oregon, in the, the lumber room in Portland, which I just did in October. So just showing you some installation shots from that. And there we go come to the end, which is my latest work that just left the studio, um, untitled piece. <laughs> and, and that's where I'm at. If anybody has any questions, I would love to answer them. No, it was, it, um, so the question was, where was I staying in the country? Um, it was in, in Massachusetts, in like the Berkshire area. Yeah. Yes. So the question is, do I have an idea of what's ahead <laughs> with my work? And I would say no, <laughs> not really. I mean, I, I feel like um, the work kind of leads me in a way. Like, I don't lead the work. Like, it, like I, I figure it out from doing the work. Like, it, it evolves as I'm doing. Like, I'm, and I, I know people who don't work that way. So it's like a different way of working, I think. Like. I know people who are very like tied to a concept and that's 
what they will um, devise the work around, you know? Whereas I feel like I more, like it's mu much more fluid the way I, I, I think and evolve. And so the work takes me somewhere. Um, so I don't, I don't know where it'll end up. I mean, this, you know, this last piece, um, these last couple of pieces have been on the wall. So that's kind of a new thing for me. Like I haven't, I haven't really dealt with wall space before. And so it was, it was kind of exciting to like realize like, oh, I don't, don't just have to be on the floor. I can also take over the wall. <laughs> and, and so that o that's opened up a whole new uh, way of working, you know, like floor and, and wall together um, now. Did you have, yeah. I'm not sure even how to rephrase that question. Um, <laughs> so the, I think the question was, do um, how like how do I see the works relating to each other in a s in a space? Like how if they're transmitters, like how how then are they affecting each other? Yeah, I think I I mean I fantasize about that. Like I s I see them sometimes as like beings that are from a family. You know, like there, there's the mother, or the mama, the papa. <laughs> like it's like they're they're like connected, um, psychologically connected. So they um, affect they they affect each other in space, but not anything we can actually see with our eyes. Um, so the question is if I have a social practice with the work, um, with the mycelium, and no, I don't. <laughs> I wish I did. <laughs> I would like to. That, that could be really wild. Um, I'm trying to think of an artist who, who does, is there so anyone who does that with mycelium? There's this really great book called, um, I think it's Mushroom at the End of the World. Did, did you know that? Yeah. Which suggests that like the cult, the gathering of mushrooms is like a, you know, like a, a way to revolutionize the economy and reject capitalism. And yeah, <laughs> I'm all for that. <laughs> Yeah, um, so the question was, um, 
like in, in relation to um, watching a child work, making art, and how, how exactly can one um, learn how to do that <laughs> uh, in that free way, you know? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think for me, like, like I end up spending a lot of time sitting around in my studio, like not actually always there working nonstop, you know, like, and, and I'm just sitting there thinking, you know, so I'm not doing anything. And then, and then there's this kind of build up, build up and build up. And then I just like attack and start working in that more kind of improvisational way, you know. Um, but like with my kid, like he didn't, doesn't have that, he didn't have that time period where he's just sitting there <laughs> meditating of, over ideas, you know, he's just, uh, was just working. Um, it was, it was, um, it was hard at first to, to push myself to work that way because I, you know, had a s I had such a system down of like, I'd make a drawing and then I would make a work, uh, an armature for the piece, I had everything sort of laid out and I knew exactly what, or more or less what the piece would look like at the end. Um, but, but the minute that I, accepted the materials, like the, that eureka moment that I described, where I accepted this new, these new materials, then the materials suddenly informed like how I could deal with um, form, you know, like, like there, there was no, um, there's no, there was no knowing, there was no, um, no material was off limits, like there was no, no knowing not, there was nothing predictable about like what could be used as as a as a material. So, so j the unpredict the unpredictability of that pushed the work in into a more kind of improvisational way of working. So it was really about a lot about the material and about accepting material. And then, just as a side note, I just want to say that. Um, there was a period early on also where my kid was very young and he would make stuff in my studio and I would um, ask him if I could uh, steal, take it. <laughs> and so I was actually like using some of his little things here and there in on, on these sculptures and he would like lead people around and point out like, I did that hanging blob there and you know. <laughs> so I exploited the the, the child. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, so, oh, yeah, I have to repeat your question, I just remembered. Um, no, I mean, I have to repeat, yeah, no, it's okay. Um, so you were, so the question is, um, do I, in working with illusionistic space, um, do, does it ever happen where a form looks too much like something that I don't want it to be, and then, I have to kind of deny it that um, illusion or whatever. Um, so, so I think, like the way, like, like I felt, I, c I kind of feel like there were no mistakes. Like, there's never a mistake. Like, there's no such thing. Like, it all kind of gets absorbed into the process, and and it comes out. And and the piece is not necessarily ever really 
finished. Like, like I feel like they could, like the works could just, like I announce that something is done, right? Like this piece is done. Um, when it doesn't kind of bug me anymore, it's, it's done. But honestly, like I've had so many times where I've looked back on stuff and thought, I could keep going on this. There is no real end to it, you know? Like, it, it's all like one thing in a way. Like, it's like this fluid thing where, um, yeah, maybe something is starting to look like too much of something and becomes a cliche of itself, but then it can always morph into something else. So I never really feel like, oh no, there's a, it's a mistake or, you know. <laughs> Does that answer your question? Okay. <laughs> yes. Yes. I, I would like to actually, yeah. I would. I'd like to start um, working. Yeah, yeah. I really love beeswax, um, but it's a pain to work with. <laughs> but I would like to bring um, the bees back, the the beeswax back more. And oh, and and getting and as as far as bees go, that there is a paper wasp nest that I found, so I put paper mache behind it and, what's that? Oh, I had a, pa uh, <laughs> I had a paper wasp nest in the backyard last summer that I saturated with it, and I know I'm just picking it up every day, and then uh, it went so nasty to be destroyed the whole thing. Oh, no. <laughs> Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, they're pretty cool. And dangerous, too. It's really dangerous working with yeah. them because you can buy them for a dollar now. Yeah. And I um, learned that they make them out of the cellulose that they, you know, that they consume, like from um, bark, I guess. And then uh, they patch them together with their saliva. And so they have, like, kind of a weird smell, too, because of that. It's it's wasp saliva, wasp wasp saliva, yeah. <laughs> um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. That I wanted? <laughs> no, it's uh, no. <laughs> I really can't. I don't know why I started using colors. It's such a mistake. No, I, no, I, I um. I I felt like color is. Ha, ha, like color has the same kind of electrical energy that line was was having, and so then using the colored line is like you know electrifying the line that much more. So, um, is that yeah? <laughs> Well, thank you so much.
can you help the teacher with the podium? I'm, I'll just, I will, I will remove it um, after you 